Oh, we're starting to get close. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Multiple rapid fire mini projects today in part four of my Tomb of Horrors build. All crafting, pure focus. Hey everyone, Wylock here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to part four of my complete Tomb of Horrors build. Today we only have two rooms on deck, but they're both pretty densely packed with lots of features, lots of mini projects to get through. So let's hop over to the table and get started. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. So we've come to the end of a crawlway from room 10. The floor goes out or something like that, it's explained in the text, but then you get dumped into this room, room 13, the chamber of three chests. Three large chests are affixed firmly to the floor. One of them is gold, and in there there's a swarm of poisonous snakes. One is silver, with a trap that doesn't need to be modeled. And the last one is oak, that causes a giant skeleton to teleport in. Let's start with the wooden chest. Pretty simple, I took one of those jumbo sized popsicle sticks and cut off the two ends, and then some of these small flat wooden picks. I think toothpicks would work too, but whatever, small wood bits, and just hot glue those around to form the outside. I also hot glued in a glass bead to add some weight. And the text also says it is bound with thick bronze bands, so I'm just gonna hot glue on some strips of cardstock and paint those up accordingly. Now in the appendix, it says that this giant skeleton is huge, but even just looking at the map, there wouldn't be room for a three x three square creature in here. So I'm making an executive call. I'm gonna put this on a two inch base and make it a large miniature. This is simply a 3D printed miniature that I bought from Fat Dragon Games and then scaled up and mounted to a two inch base. Not gonna dive deep here on painting miniatures. This was real simple. Block in colors and then washes. The two metal chests, I used double corrugated cardboard, just cut some small bits, hot glued two of them together, and clad the outside with cardstock. Also attached a slab of chipboard to the top for interest, and a bit from my leftover costume jewelry drawer to form a clasp. And then just paint it up, one gold, one silver. Easy enough. Alright, let's see what's next. Oh no. Oh no. Do not do this. Do not do it. It's unnecessary. Do not bejewel them. Do not bejewel them. Do not bejewel them. They don't need gemstones. They're perfectly fine. They don't need gemstones just because it's fantasy scatter terrain. Stop. Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, some of us have a tendency to bejewel things just because they're fantasy. These look fine as is. Maybe they should be simpler. Let everything else be the statement in the room. Sometimes more is less, and despite the fact that these just look like candy and they're just so fun to put on and they make everything sparkle and be colorful, uh, they're, they're just not always necessary. So I resolved that I was not gonna, I'm not gonna do that for these. Um, I don't need to bejewel them. That said, I did go ahead and bejewel them because gemstones are freaking awesome and why wouldn't you use them? So last is that swarm of poisonous snakes that comes out of the gold chest. I used vinyl coated paper clips just bent a whole bunch of them into snake-like shapes, super glued them to a one inch base in a tangled manner, and then I cut some little diamonds of cardstock and hot glued those to the end. These are like the head of the asp, if you will. It looks silly up close, but from like two feet away or further, it looks like a tangle of snakes. The snakes just get primed and then painted up with like a caiman green and then a light green for the heads. No washes or highlighting, not really concerned about that. This will be fine from two feet away. Also, the tunnel that goes from room 7 to room 3 has a plug in its ceiling, which is this room's floor. So for that I just cut two circles of chipboard, and I painted one to look like the tunnel below, and then the other to look like the granite floor, and hot glued it on so it looks like that plug was like picked up and moved out of the way. So if the players come in that way, or otherwise find that secret door, I can just drop this in. So that's room 13.
Room 14, the Chapel of Evil. There's a whole lot going on in here. I love this room, and it could easily be tricked up by adding some combat. On that note, people will sometimes, you know, complain or at least point out that this module isn't focused on combat. It's about player knowledge as opposed to character knowledge and ability to solve puzzles and stuff, but you could easily spruce this up. It's basically a blank slate. You could absolutely add monsters in anywhere you want. And this room in particular has a lot of opportunity. You see what is obviously some form of temple area. There's paintings on the wall, etc. And there's a mosaic path leading between four rows of wooden pews that face the worship area. In front of those is a wooden railing, and in front of that is an altar in front of a tiered dais upon which there is a wooden chair. Now what about that mosaic path? Why isn't it in the tile, right? I did that like for room three and room 10. Well, the answer is these are a lot of work to make. Uh, th these being these halves. I mean, look at the, <laughs> can't even can't even manage these. It's a huge room, it's a square, uh, and it's got walls on all four sides. So I could use this in the future for like a big showdown, put any kind of scatter terrain on it. So I may want to use this outside of the Tomb of Horrors. Therefore, it would be silly to hard code its purpose just for putting that mosaic tile down. So instead of making it integral to the spaces, we're going to make a drop in or an overlay piece, whatever you want to call it. And in fact, I reused that exact same Photoshop that I did for room 10. Then I used glue stick to attach it to chipboard so I wouldn't get too much warping, and cut them out. Piece of cake, so they drop right in. The dais, or maybe it's pronounced dais. I'm sure someone will let me know. But anyway, that's just an arch. So, uh, quick tip, if you ever want to cut something like an arch that's perfectly symmetric, freehand draw one half of it, trace it, flip it over, and trace it again. That ensures that it's gonna be mirror symmetric. A lot easier than trying to freehand a true even curve. Anyway, these are just two slabs of double corrugated cardboard, and I glued those together, covered the corrugation, and painted them up with the, I guess I'll call it the alternate gray scheme for this dungeon that I've been using. The wooden pews were pretty easy. I just took some Jenga blocks. Actually, this is a dollar store knockoff version of Jenga, and hot glued on some jumbo popsicle sticks, clipped some corners, and painted it up like wood. And of course, a happy little gem. Eight of those, done and done. The railings also kept this pretty simple because they're railings. Jumbo popsicle sticks for their base, had to hot glue a couple together to make it long enough. Wooden dowels for the actual uh, rail, railing, the posts. And then coffee stirrer on top. All right, what else is in the room? The chair is nicely carved and padded, but seems unremarkable. Well, in my last video, I made a chair, and it's kind of remarkable, but if this has no mechanical purpose, I'm just gonna use it, so I'm not making a new one. Boom, chair. And then on each side of the dais are large brass candelabras, each holding five white candles, and then some white urns in the corners. Okay, urns first, because those are really easy. Just these common wooden bits you find at the craft store, and glue on a bead, prime it, paint it up to match. White urn with a brass stopper. The candelabra is much more fun. This is a modular like pipe straw toy that I found on Amazon. Actually, a lot of people use it on these crafting channels. So I cut one in half and then hot glued it to a one inch base along with a wooden dowel in the middle there. That's gonna be the main post. And then I punched out some chipboard circles with a hole punch, five of them to be exact. And then I'm gonna use hot glue on a toothpick. This is the typical DM Scotty method for candles. Just leave the last few millimeters of the tip there uncoated, chop it off, and then hot glue it onto those uh, platters or whatever they are. Final coated paper clip. I unbent it and then lately, again, I've been obsessed with this uh, gel control super glue and accelerant. So I used that old trick to get a nice instant hard connection there. Yep, love that. It does saturate the chipboard a bit, but if you let it dry, it's no problem. And I attach those to the main post in the same way. Here it is before priming, and here it is afterwards. I used my airbrush to apply a nice smooth coat of bronze, and then wash it with some Army Painter Soft Tone to give it character. Paint up the candles with a beige, and then yellow and orange at the tips. 
And here it is all done. It is much stronger than it looks. I accidentally dropped it once or twice. Sprawled on the floor near the west wall is a skeleton who is sort of pointing towards an archway in the wall that's filled with an opaque, bright orange vapor. The archway. I'm so freaking tired of making these. I made it exactly as I did the first two, so I'm not going to revisit that. The only difference here is none of the stones are glowing. The mist is glowing though, so after giving it the sealant to crisp it up, I airbrushed it with a bright orange. The skeleton on the ground is just a miniature that I already had, I think it was 3D printed, so I cut off its base and just laid it down there. So there he is on the ground, pointing to the archway. And that brings us finally to the altar. The centerpiece of this chapel is a block of strange material that glows with an inner light of opalescent blue. If it's touched, then it triggers a lightning bolt, and then it starts to glow with a fiery blue-red. And then there's a second stage to the trap. I'm going to use this hard plastic. It's about a millimeter thick. I bought it online. It's different than packaging, like from a product. That's really flimsy stuff. Uh, you could use that. You could get away with it. But I had this lying around from another project, so I chopped up the rectangles that I needed to put a box together and then put the box together with thin beads of hot glue on a low temperature. And then I use this stained glass paint, also from the other project that's forthcoming. Works really well. I had some dust on there and you can see it, it actually created some cool texture, but you want to make sure that the surface is clean before you use that stuff. I'm going to stuff this with polyfill to make it look opalescent, uh, sort of cloud it a little bit, and then I'm putting together a circuit with two red LEDs. I've done circuits a lot in the past. I'll throw a card on the screen in case you want to look at the basics. I'm not going to revisit it all here. The foundation is just double corrugated cardboard with the corrugation covered up and then I excavated some of it out of the bottom to have room for the circuit. And here we are testing it. It's not pretty, but it doesn't need to be. Good to go. And then I painted that up with the, the alternate stone colors that I've been using. And then the box just gets glued on top of that. So here it is. And uh, in this particular rotation here, it doesn't really show up. <laughs> Nor. Can I mean, that doesn't look like much at all, but on the table, the red light really does show up when the trap goes off. So here's the story so far. Let's go down to room 10 and then take the secret passageway over to room 13. This is where the three chests are, as well as that plug to the passageway underneath. We'll just pan around here for a moment and take a look. And once again, with the one and a quarter inch grid and no wall offsets, this can be built exactly as drawn in the map. So it's placed on top of that passageway from room three, exactly as drawn. And now from above, let's go back to room 10 and make our way over to room 14 through that secret passageway. And our intrepid party is in here. They're about to get to the secret door. And the first thing they see is that mosaic pathway, which drops in quite nicely. Sometimes you get lucky. I think I'm gonna get a lot of mileage out of this particular Photoshop's tile set. Print and paste is becoming more and more attractive to me, honestly. I thought about putting padding on the wooden pews to match the chair in the front, but I never know if I wanna use these in some other temple, so wood, just plain wood looks good in good or evil or whatever color scheme. I just left it as is. Orange mist, the Cheetos archway, if you will. Crazy stuff happens if you walk through that. Railing's kind of large. I've never really cared much about scale though. And then that chair from the video I did last week. Now someone did comment, oh, are you gonna use that in Tomb of Horrors? I said, yes. They said, awesome, it'll make a great throne for the throne room. And I realized, yeah, there is a throne room later on. So I'll use it for that and I'll come back and make a new chair for this room. So the non-mechanical stuff in this room, the urns, the candelabras, the chair, that's where I think it's rife to introduce your homebrewed ideas. If you're going to go to the trouble of making this stuff, homebrew something to go with it and make the terrain matter. All right, coming along nicely. Again, if this whole thing is exciting to you, you should check out the Tabletop Crafters Guild on Facebook. Huge group, 33,000 members strong and growing. And if you liked today's video, of course, you're going to enjoy the other parts in the series. But here's two other videos that I think you'll also enjoy. So till I see you next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games.